Hi, so it's quite a long time since I've looked at any thermal imaging products, but um, recently Infrared got in touch and asked me if I wanted to have a look at their P2 Pro and mobile phone thermal images. I thought, yeah, that might be interesting. First impressions is this thing is tiny. If we compare it to the seat, much, much smaller. They claim it's the smallest thermal camera available at the moment. A couple of interesting things sort of make this stand out. Firstly, it's got fairly decent resolution. It's 256 by 192 pixels, but also because it's not come from a US company, they're not bound by the US frame rate limitations due to their um, export regulations so this one actually claims to do 25 frames per second um, resolution so we can actually measure that and see um, what the actual achievable frame rate is i've been using this for a few weeks on and off and the increased frame rate is actually a benefit and when you're just sort of looking around a scene trying to figure out what you're looking at um, the inf increased frame rate is actually pretty helpful there's also an optional extra this is a clip-on macro lens this is just a uh, magnetically attached lens and this gives you a working distance and field of view around about 30 millimeters so it's good for very close up work particularly on uh, your PCBs and other electronic work. It also comes a standard with a, a USB-C extension cable and I found this is actually quite useful especially if, you know, if you're looking around a PCB it's quite handy to sort of do, just to be able to move that around and have the uh, the phone station and obviously the phone's not, not in the way. Um, something I've also found useful which I've got th this isn't supplied but I picked this up on eBay I think is just a USB-C right angle cable. I was having to do some diagnostics in a situation where there's a lot, quite a lot of wires and cables sort of floating around so just to be able to stick this on the back just made it a little bit easier to sort of poke it in in the conjunction with the um, cable so you can actually sort of poke it around inside something so I found that was a, a useful addition. Um, one slight disappointment is this is the only sort of casing they supply this just sort of this soft bag which isn't sort of particularly useful. Um, I've actually sort of improvised the case this is actually a, um, a memory card case and I just chopped the foam in so it's out of the original packaging of this. This fits the camera, the lens, my um, USB-C right angle extension and if you coil the cable upright it, this will actually fit in the lid as well so you can this whole thing all sort of clipped together. I would, I'm looking for a slightly shorter USB-C cable because this is you have to coil this just right to, for it to um, snap shut but I think it would be nice if they did actually do a, um, a hard case for it. I think that would be quite useful addition. Now this currently only supports Android, obviously there's an app for it in the Google Play Store, it's slightly disconcerting that the uh, tagline for it's in Chinese but it seems to sort of load and install and work quite happily in, the, in English. And you can configure this so that when you plug it in it'll auto run the app. And I found this doesn't always work properly but I've had similar problems with other cameras under it so I think it could be at least as much an Android problem as a problem with this app. It starts up pretty quickly, does sort of all the sort of things you'd expect a thermal camera to do and you see the frame rate is actually pretty Good. it's very responsive there is a little bit of latency on there um, you see sort of there's a slight delay yeah, I've not really noticed it as being particularly annoying you know when you're doing the typical sort of work of just looking around say PCBs and so on trying to find them and so you can see a nice uh, hot cup of tea there the app's got all the sort of functions that you'd expect um, for something like this when you pop that out you've got um, image rotation because obviously when you're using it with the cable you want it the other way up to when you're when it's stuck to the bottom of the phone so you've got um, all the four normal um, orientations upside down also you can do a rotation to do uh, portrait landscape etc and you can also make it mirror I'm not quite sure why you'd want that but uh, you can do that other things we've got here we've got uh, the various corrections for emissivity ambient temperature um, I suspect that's to do with the um, the shutter compensation I'd expect there's probably some temperature measurement there so I'm not quite sure why it needs to know ambient temperature also object distance now there is a um, it's like a picture-in-picture -picture mode where it uses the phone camera um, but this object distance thing doesn't seem to actually make any difference we can sort of pop that around there it won't do the image overlaying that we saw on the, um, the FLIR cameras but to, uh, once you've got decent resolution frame rate I don't find that actually particularly useful it's, it's useful for a very low resolution camera to make sense of what you're seeing but for this it's not that necessary but I think this could be useful for example just for documentation purposes when you want to show some actual you know, real world imaging and the um, thermal image overlaid on the same picture particularly if you're doing like photographs and um, documentation type things so that's uh, potentially quite useful and um, it's got a few image modes I'm not totally sure exactly what the difference is between the high image quality and the wide range now one other interesting thing about this camera that just differentiates it between some of the others is that in wide range mode it's, the, its measurement goes to up to much higher temperatures than most other cameras this goes up to actually 550 degrees C so quite happily image sort of soldering iron so if we just put this on there we can see its temperature is showing uh, 
I think the emissivity of this is maybe not ideal. This is showing 450, which is, seems a little bit higher than it should be. But say the emissivity is probably a significant factor that needs to be set it set right, but it will actually image it. Um, one slight curious thing is if you put it in high quality mode, it does some, have some sort of slightly weird um, sort of image artifacts when it gets overloaded, but that's not a big deal. Just remember to put it into wide range mode when you're looking at uh, really hot objects. Now there's a couple of different um, temperature modes. This is the default one, you can turn this on and off again through this menu, just turn the temperature display on and off. So in this mode it shows you sort of hot and cold points in the image. But there's also what I call professional thermometry mode and this gives quite a lot more options. So this mode we can select points, so you can just select individual points and it will display the, the um, temperature of those points. But we can also have a line and it will show min max average across that line and a rectangle again we can it will show min and max and that average over that whole rectangle this is currently in the automatic uh, scaling mode so it will just adjust the um, color scale according to the temperature but you can actually manually adjust that as well so the, it looks like the color section is between the limits you've, se you've selected so you can actually uh, you can get it to only colorize temperatures within a, a certain range and of course you've got the selection of various different palettes or simple monochrome and all the other all the usual sort of variants You can take one-off photos, but it can also do video. So I can just record a little sequence of, um, sort of thermal video and probably put a, um, an overlay on there as well. So for sort of documentation type purposes, I think that's a really handy facility. Okay, I've just been playing around with the video recording mode. There's one minor annoyance here. When you start recording, it always pops the camera view up to the top left-hand corner, which is also where it puts the temperature information so if you want to yeah the nice thing is that you can do video recording with audio uh, and the screen so for like survey and inspection type work this would be really handy you can get all the information in one place um, so you do have to remember to move this away otherwise the um, yeah the temperature overlaying on the image might make it a little bit hard to see in the uh, final video if we just take a look at that video back see we have got the temperature information but when it's overlaid onto this image it's quite hard to see but obviously with the um the background of the uh, thermal image it's much easier to read but obviously you know, it's very handy to be able to record everything all combined into a single file for reporting uh, applications it does have a calibration shuttle like most cameras and this this option here just get, lets you manually calibrate so if you got a sudden ambient temperature change you can force it to calibrate but it, it calibrates by itself not particularly noticeable uh, you can just about hear it if I just there's a few other settings so we've got this professional thermometry and that basically switches between a single point and the um, all, the, all the various options like lines and rectangles and stuff advanced image setting I'm not totally sure what an image optimized does um, automatic shutter switch I think that actually stops it doing the calibration shutter while you're shooting video that will allow us like a time lapse, time lapse mode which might be useful if you're looking at sort of something heating up over time the other thing which I've never seen on another camera is just burn protection where if it sees something which is it thinks is so hot that it might cause damage it actually sh closes the calibration shutter and keeps it closed and it gives you a, a warning message one thing that I think could be improved is you've got these two different ways of setting up. You've got this sort of quick quick access menu thing for the you know, like the flip and various other things, and you've got other stuff that's in this settings menu. I think they could maybe have done a better job of perhaps integrating those. It seems a bit odd. Yeah, it's a bit annoying that you have to go to these different two different places. And it's not necessarily obvious which place you have to go to for a certain setting. So that's sort of just a minor thing they could perhaps improve. But apart from that, I mean, the software seems to do pretty much everything you'd want it to. To test the frame, mate, what I've got is just a little motor here with a sort of at black and reflective surface and the bench the heat from the bench light will get reflected off that surface so we should see a, a sort of rotating pattern so in order to um, measure the frame rate we'll just increase the motor speed until we see the, the, you know, the strobing stop and it lock in one place and then there's a simple infrared reflective um, thing here which I can use to measure the, the speed to get the, uh, the frame rate. We just gradually speed the motor up until we get the uh, motion frozen it's about there and yeah that's uh really 24 hertz exactly on the on the scope so yeah it is actually true 24 frames a second 
Um, I did try this on an older phone and it did, did appear to be a little bit slow. This is a Samsung A52s. Um, I've also tried it on A51 which is a slightly older phone again it still gets um, 24 frames a second uh, quite happily. And even with quite an old phone it still manages 24 frames a second. This is a Samsung J5 running Android 6 and this still manages 24 frames a second uh, quite happily so, um, so it's not dependent on a, on a powerful phone to get decent frame rate. This will actually work as a webcam under Windows. I haven't got the right conversion lead but I just used one of these um, USB monitor things just to get it plugged into the PC. The orientation is like that way around. You don't have any control over um, things like um, pallets or other things but so it does actually work quite happily as a um, a webcam which so that yeah potentially gives you the opportunity for you know, running other software for uh, doing other sort of things maybe more specialist applications um, I'm not sure if there are any plans to produce like a proper Windows uh, map it might not, might be nice just to have a little program so you can control stuff like the um, palette and temperature ranges and so on there are some other variants of this made by other manufacturers I believe they do actually provide an SDK there's some um, discussion on EV blog about this so if you're interested in that you might be worth taking a look to see what the uh, what people have found out about that uh, as well as running a PC, I've also got it to uh, run on a Raspberry Pi quite easily. Uh, this is using the MotionEye software, which is really simple to set up. Video application, you download an image, burn it onto an SD card, and then configure it over um, a simple network interface. This allows sort of video recording, time lapses, motion detection, and sort of remote operation. So, you know, there's a very simple way to just convert this into a, uh, a networkable um, thermal imaging camera. All I did, I just used the standard configuration, told it it was a USB camera, set the resolution up to the uh, 256 by 192, and it uh, just worked. So that's uh, really easy uh, easy setup. The frame rate isn't quite as fast as on the phone. I don't know enough about this to know where the bottleneck is, whether it's the Raspberry Pi itself or whether some settings you can tweak to um, speed it up. But it's still you know perfectly perfectly usable. It's not not, not quite as smooth as uh, on the phone, but yeah, there may well be ways to um, tweak that and improve the uh, performance. So just uh, looking at some PCBs, this is the Raspberry Pi. Um, you can actually see that this chip over here looks like it's actually got three separate die in it. And interestingly, if we uh, just boot it up, we can actually see um, each die sort of starting up as all the drivers load. If we just turn it on, as it starts up, we can see them actually coming on in sequence. It's quite interesting. So the focus distance is say, about 30 odd millimetres. And again, the field of view is similar again, maybe 25, 30 millimetres. So for like real, real close up, you can certainly see your individual surface mount components very clearly, very easily. No uh, obvious sort of passes getting hot there particularly. But you can see obviously the um, bottom left, that's the inductor for the uh, power supply. Okay, so here's a realistic fault finding situation. We've got this large PCB here, and we've got a short across the power supply that supplies all these chips along the top. So I've just set my power supply to one volt uh, at four amp current limit. So obviously, if you keep the voltage low, then there's no serious risk of damaging any um, semiconductor devices now because this is across the power supply. I know, you know it's a five volt rail, so putting one volt through it's not going to be a problem. But if you've got for example, tracing a short on something that isn't a power supply, then you know if you reduce your supply voltage down to maybe half a volt or something, then you can put quite happily put a couple of amps through without risking damaging any semiconductors. If we look at the thermal image and turn the power on now. So we've got about two amps going through the five volt rail, which is originating sort of down here where this uh, crock clip's connected. So we can now see that these um, tracks are lit up. This big, that's just the phone uh, at the top of the screen. And it stops just here. And if you look down here, that's where I just soldered a wire across this cap, just to illustrate this uh, technique. So I thought I'd have a look at whether the wide range mode of this is useful for things like hot air rework, just to get an idea of sort of temperature so you can uh, optimize the spread of the hot air just to you know, avoid damaging other components. Well, I think the, um, this manual scaling is a bit clunky in the way it works. It ends the temperatures, but it seems like there's a few too many keystrokes. So you go high, if I want to say high, let's say that's at 300. And then, okay, low, say 250. You don't have to do okay, then confirm. There's slightly too many keystrokes. So this will only colorize it when it's within that range. So um, if we sort of hit this chip, and I'm not sure 
how useful this is. This will be for every day, but it could be quite handy if you're just learning and practicing, just to get an idea of, sort of how to move the hot air around to get things to the right temperature. So you see now we're up up at the within that range over the whole chip. So that should be just about ready to come off. And yeah, but one thing I've noticed is is a little bit apart from the slight clunkiness and entering the figures there are a few odd things happen for example if you change the orientation it resets that setting but also when you go into that it doesn't show what the current values are and, you know you have to re-enter every time which is it's just a little bit of a sort of clunkiness which i'm sure could be uh, fixed in fact and also when you go back into it it just reset it doesn't show you what the previous values are which is really annoying you should be able to just set the value then go back into it and then change one of them um, but again, now, now we've gone into this weird mode, I'm not doing it, we've, we've got, we're still showing like a normal temper range, it's not, it's not actually um, done it, so there's definitely something not quite right about the way it, uh, it does this. And the only way I found of getting out of this, I think it was actually um, exit and restart, so if I try setting that again, 300, okay, um, 250, okay, yeah, it's still not done that. I think yeah, you actually have to exit from the app and restart it to get that to work again, which is uh, rather annoying. Now in some applications it's handy to actually have the camera fixed, or looking at a fixed object. And obviously you could make, yeah, there isn't really any um, sort of mounting on this, it's just a rectangular thing. And obviously you could make some sort of clip holder or something. But I find it's just as easy if you get one of these little right angle um, USB-C adapters, just yeah, fi fix that however to whatever it is you want to clamp it to. Then that just plugs in and just makes a nice little, uh, little hole because it's so small and light. Yeah, the connector is more than uh, adequate as, the, uh, as a way of mounting it. That works uh, quite nicely. Okay, let's take a look inside. I believe this is a basic impl implementation of InfraRay's Tiny 1B, which is a sort of thermal imaging module. They supply sort of to OEMs, I can't find much data on it. It's available as a separate unit, which I believe is sort of basically a PCB with the flex on it, looking at the pictures on the um, their website, although the module on their website is slightly different, the packaging on this chip's different. This did put up a bit of a fight getting it apart, so it is still working though. Basically the case is two pieces of uh, machined aluminium, and this board is actually glued into this back half and it looks like there's a screw holding this front board here which is the interface the usb interface so apparently the um infrared do have their own custom asic which is presumably this for controlling this stuff um there's uh, some labels on the pins it's got sort of mostly miso's or spi interface also it's also got um power supply stuff on the front here there is something on the back the module is quite a bit bigger than the uh, the fleur lepton which is i've got here um, as far as I can tell, sort of their OEM solution is sort of the board with their thing and the chip. It's not like a single um, module. A flex here, this goes to the shutter for the uh, background compensation. Uh, the lens in here is quite seriously glued in, so I'm not going to try taking that out. I do want to keep this working, so I find it quite useful. On the front, there's a uh, just a window there. I'm not sure that's... My guess would be probably silica, and it's sort of, it's sort of flat on both sides. Um, it's not at all transparent to... So visible light um, it could, so it's probably the silicon or germanium um, not really sure how to tell all right so on the back of this is a realtek rts 5830 and i couldn't find any information at all about this chip so i've no idea what that is but i'd imagine it's probably sort of to do with the usb interface i mean i would imagine that their ASIC has probably got something like a spy interface because so, we do see some spy uh, names on there and maybe that then gets interfaced to USB via whatever this is. Hard to say really, it's not you know, without any information on what that chip is. There's another 8-pin chip in here, which chip here, which I imagine is probably something like an E squared prom for device ID and configuration on the USB side. Um, there's a little board support interconnect here that connects to the um, USB-C connector. Now if they do an iPhone version of this, they'd probably have to include Apple's bullshit DRM chip in there. Now whether there's space for that in here or, or they'd have to use a bigger casing, I don't know. But you can see whether they uh, they do an Apple version. But obviously this is interchangeable for a different um, connector type. And so this this was sort of glued here, there's quite a lot of glue on here, so I had to just heat the back and very, very carefully, very slowly prise this board until it uh, popped out. This is this is a flex rigid assembly, so you've got like the PCBs are layered up. I don't want to bend this and straighten this out too much because I don't want to risk fracturing these um these flexes, but it's a sort of multi-layer like standard PCB with a layer of flex in the middle. So the vias will go through the main PCB and the flex to provide this um, interconnect without uh, having any space taken up by connectors. 
and on here there's just three um, switch mode regulators according to the information I found on the modern it needs 5 volts, 3.3 volts and 1.8 volts now, I did try x-raying it but this looks like there's too much metal in there for my uh, x-ray machine to penetrate unfortunately right, I've had a little bit of a poke around on these uh, test points on the back of the PCB there is spy traffic but I uh, can't really make much sense out of it the stuff on mostly and miso so it's not all sort of usually one way uh, but there's no obvious sort of framing it so the data's a bit too jittery to uh, see any obvious correlation between sort of the image and the data I'm seeing interesting there is also a labelled TXD and RXD UART port and um, when it starts up we do see sort of a bunch of data on there um, nothing hugely interesting it looks like mostly parameters and so on i'll just stick a copy in the description in case you want to have a look at, at it but there's uh, nothing obviously exciting in there so um, overall this is a very nice unit you know the combination of decent uh, resolution and the high frame rate it's pretty much my sort of go-to thermal camera these days i've got the uh, the flare and the seat handheld unit but i just find that yeah, because of the flexibility in the frame rate and the image quality this is generally the one that I go for first the um, the macro lens I don't find myself using very often um, so we can see the sort of general field of view so if you've got a ball with something getting hot this is just like the normal view and because of the resolution frame rate you know you pretty much get to where you want to get to if we put the macro lens we can see you know we can actually get down to finer details but yeah I don't really often need to see in that much detail you know maybe if you had like a much denser board where you actually need to narrow down for example a bigger you know, array of 0402 resistors seeing which one's getting hot then uh, i think it'd be more useful of course there is an alternative to that you um you can also use sort of a laser cutter lens to get uh, pretty much the same effect obviously you need to figure out a way of mounting it but this is just just holding on the front fairly crudely so you get a sort of fairly similar sort of result well, actually just compare the temperature obviously i don't know how well calibrated the um temperature would be the center of that chip's reading sort of 30 with the uh, laser cutter lens and with this macro lens 20 28 so it's it's not it's not that far off 29 yes yeah, it's, it's fairly close so uh, and for this application you, you know, you're really concerned really with um accuracy so without the uh, macro we're getting about 30. Now, i suppose if you wanted to get some extreme close-ups you could use the macro lens and an additional lens so that's getting us uh, like an SO8 basically full screen although so I don't really know when you'd ever actually need to do that but uh, you can do it if you want to thermal image really small things so the, the macro it's a nice to have but certainly uh, not by no means essential and not quite as convenient as uh, something with an adjustable lens um, Infrared do make a f fairly wide range of thermal cameras this is the lowest end version but they do do versions with adjustable lenses and also complete self-contained units as well as the um, the phone product so this is a very very nice unit and I certainly wouldn't hesitate to recommend it and certainly of the phone cameras I think this is pretty much the leader now if you go to their website they have an online store but they're basically linking to aliexpress and amazon and it's worth looking around at different sellers because there, there's quite a wide range of pricing just check whether or not the macro lens is included because that, that may, that's one reason for the difference in prices on some stores but even for the basic model there's quite a wide range of prices so i suggest you have a look around um, to see uh, what's available for the uh, the best price but uh, no very nice unit